So hello everybody in Hall 2. We'll be starting in about a minute with the presentation from Dr. Cope. So please get yourselves ready. Okay, good afternoon, Hall 2, and welcome back. Our next presenter is Dr. Tristan Culp, who is uh, the Executive Medical Director and a consultant in critical care medicine at the Liverpool University Hospitals. And he is also a lead uh, uh, clinician at the Northwest Recompression Unit um, in Wiral. Is that correct? I hope I said that. Um, so I encourage you to listen to his presentation, um, which kind of ties in with Laura's presentation from before and some of the medical aspects related to diving. So, Dr. Culp, the stage is yours. Thanks very much, Ray. Um, good afternoon, everyone, or, or whatever time it is uh, in the part of the world that you're listening in. It's afternoon in the UK here. My name is Tristan Cope. Um, I'm a specialist in intensive care medicine. Um, I'm also currently the medical director at Liverpool University Hospitals um, and I'm the medical director at the, the Northwest Recompression Unit on the Wirral in England, which is um, uh, a recompression facility, hyperbaric facility, covering the, the, the northwest of the UK. Um, I also, just by way of a little bit of background, I, I have a particular interest in human factors um, in relation to patient safety um, and I'm what's called a TRM instructor, that's team resource management instructor um, in healthcare, that's the sort of the, the healthcare equivalent of um, crew resource management in, in aviation. So I have a particular interest in, um, in human factors and its application. So I'm going to be talking to you for the next half hour, 40 minutes or so um, about decision making, the title's decision making in, in uncertainty. In some ways, it might have been more active, the title's decision making under pressure. And that's certainly part of what I'll be talking about, drawing on examples and experience in the healthcare setting and, and to some extent other industries um, and looking at how we can potentially uh, apply this to the recreational and, and technical diving setting. Um, so this is the, the sort of environment that I um, usually work in when I'm working clinically. This is a, a rather old slide, so it's a little bit out of date now, but it gives you a little bit of an idea of um, certainly the technological interfaces that um, surround us um, and, and surround uh, um, the care of our sickest patients in the intensive care unit, um, providing uh, what you might describe as life support, advanced organ support, um, to those patients so there's a lot of there's a lot of tech there's a lot of equipment going on um, and all of that equipment interfaces with the patient and of course there are interfaces with the with the staff operating the equipment as well so you know there are some similarities there to, uh, to technical diving and particularly the more advanced end of the technical diving spectrum um, I'm going to um, just draw out a little clinical scenario. It, 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 it's not a, an especially complex scenario, but it just gives a little bit of an illustration of um, some decision making in a medical context um, and gives us something to, to think about as we go forward with this discussion. 
So I was on duty for the intensive care unit, the hospital I work in, and we were referred a 50 year old lady, actually relatively young. She was referred from the emergency department. She'd actually previously been to a community walk-in center where they complaining of uh, shortness of breath. They put a, a pulse oximeter on her and found her to be very hypoxemic um, and immediately redirected her to our emergency department. In the emergency department, she remained hypoxic despite being given supplemental oxygen. Um, she had a chest X-ray that was suggestive of pneumonia, we were told, um, and she had a negative COVID test. That, that's obviously quite important uh, in, in these days. Um, so we admitted this lady to uh, the intensive care unit and put her on high flow oxygen. And that, that's not a picture of the lady. Obviously, it's a, a stock photo illustrating what high flow oxygen via nasal specs um, looks like. And it's a way of us being able to deliver very high flow uh, humidified oxygen in a way that's, that's tolerated well by our patients. Um, however, this lady rapidly progressed to requiring 100% oxygen, 50 litres a minute flow, which is a pretty high flow of oxygen. Um, and she was still only just maintaining oxygen saturation in the vicinity of um, 90 to 92%. So that, that was sort of borderline, that was okay. Um, but my concern was that she was going to potentially deteriorate further overnight. We were getting into the late evening at this point, and I was worried about a sort of her having a, a sudden deterioration in the middle of the night and, and requiring emergency intubation um, and mechanical support for her breathing. Also, the other thing was her, her chest x-ray didn't really you know, it looked to me like there was more going on than a simple pneumonia. There were um, there was evidence of other things going on with her with her chest. She had a background history of um, quite significant asthma and um, smoking related chest disease on top of that. Um, so so there were some significant issues there. Um, on the other side, uh, she had relatively poor kind of exercise tolerance. She was. Um, uh, pretty pretty unfit in part because of her chest disease um, also in part because of um, some back pain that she suffered from and for this lady intubation certainly wasn't going to be without risk so there was a decision there about whether we should intubate her and put on a ventilator or not and about uh, what the timing of that should be but we made a proactive decision we would um, assume that she was going to likely to deteriorate and we would intubate her in a planned way in the evening while I was still on the on the ward to supervise that happening and then so we intubated her um, that process went fairly smoothly although her oxygen saturation dropped very low during the process um, which, which wasn't necessarily unexpected um, but it was perhaps a bit more dramatic than I was expecting it to be. Um, but even once she was intubated and, and attached up to the to the ventilator to support her breathing, um, we, we were still struggling to get her oxygen saturation above 90%, even with 100% oxygen um, through the ventilator. So at this point, we were wondering, okay, so what, what, do, we, what do we do with her now? Because really we we sort of uh, you know we, we we're starting to run out of uh, options at um, this stage um extubation was clearly not going to be an option for this lady if we took her off the ventilator she almost certainly would have died very quickly um we could look at what was the optimum ventilation mode there are different sort of patterns of ventilation that you can use with a mechanical ventilator um, and different settings that we could use. We thought about whether we should prone ventilator, turn her over and, and, and put her on her front, um, which is a technique that we've been using quite a lot during COVID um, to improve oxygenation of patients and possibly even um, something called extra corporeal membrane oxygenation, which is um, like a, a, bit, a bit like a heart lung bypass machine to artificially oxygenate the blood. But although in this lady's case, that almost certainly wouldn't have been an option for her. So we, we tried a number of ventilation modes and that, that's what we did in this particular case is we, we, we looked at some choices and some options and we actually cycled through those options. 
it required a bit of time to do that because we had to give things a little bit of time to settle down and see which ventilation mode was working for it and eventually she, she settled down in one particular ventilation mode um, with with some positive airway pressure supporting her breathing and we managed to find uh, through really almost through trial and error we managed to find us some settings that would suit her reasonably <laughs> So that, that sort of describes the decisions that we made, but the question really underlying that is, is how do we make those decisions? What is it? What's the process that we go through? We all make decisions all of the time, of course. Many of those decisions are subconscious um, or with very little conscious effort. Um, some decisions that we take, of course, require a great deal of conscious effort, and there are some decisions that we um, that we struggle with, such as what to have for lunch today, for example. So it tends to be that, that we think, now this is sort of what the literature describes, we think that we make decisions in a fairly logical and, and relatively linear fashion. We assess the situation, we generate, synthesize options, and we consider those options. We then select the option that we think is most appropriate and we implement it, and we review the outcome of, of, of that option. Of course, reality is actually quite different to that. And, and as I said before, many of the decisions that we make, we actually make without um, an awful lot of conscious input. So there's a process of visually scanning, perhaps auditory scanning the environment that we're in. Um, the brain then goes through a process of subconscious pattern recognition that we may not necessarily be um, entirely aware of. But we match that those patterns with patterns in our memories, things that we've seen before, circumstances we've encountered before, looking for the closest match. Uh, and that will then lead us to a conclusion that doesn't necessarily involve looking at an array of options. This is the situation that we're in and therefore this is the solution to it. So, um, and, and that's a sort of a process of intuitive um, based decision making. So talking about certainty and, and, and uncertainty and decision making in those environments, I'm not going to talk about certainty for very long. So certainty environments exist when we have enough information to be able to predict the, with reasonable certainty, the outcomes of each alternative. Um, and, and arguably that's the ideal problem solving uh, and decision making environment to be in. But I think the question really is how often do we really encounter certainty about what outcomes will be? We know, we know sometimes we, we can say things with certainty and those tend to be things that we avoid doing. So, you know, if I drive my car into this wall at 60 miles, miles an hour, I can probably be fairly certain that the outcome won't be terribly good. Similarly, if I step off the edge of a cliff, you know, I can say with reasonable certainty that's unlikely to to um, to go well unless I'm, unless I'm wearing a parachute. But but actually, really, most of the day to day decisions that we make and, and even decisions in difficult circumstances carry much less certainty than that. So certainty is uncommon. In the healthcare environment, there's, we experience wide variation between individual patients and um, the circumstances that they're in, the conditions that they have. We can assign outcome probabilities through sort of statistical knowledge um, published in the literature or even through personal intuition and our own experience, which means that we can talk about statistical outcomes in terms of groups or numbers of patients, but it's much more difficult to make accurate predictions for individual patients and, and and individual situations. Um, in, in these real environments that we encounter, we usually don't have all the information that we might want about the situation. We don't have necessarily all of the available options in front of us, and, and we don't have um, certain knowledge uh, of, of what the possible outcomes associated with each, possible outcomes might be with each option. 
Um, and of course, and thinking in the healthcare environment, also in the diving environment, we're, we're very often time limited um, around the decisions that we make, particularly for critical decisions. And therefore, arguably, we're not always making what you might describe as an optimal decision. We're often making a decision that's good enough, and that's, that's what we're looking for. So a, a diving related case study now, um, briefly, this is Helena Folbombs is, is a wreck off the west coast of Scotland, um, sitting in about 65 metres or so of water. Uh, this was a dive I was doing with some colleagues back in the late 90s, so it's, it's nearly 25 years ago now. Um, mixed gas dive, moderate depth. Um, very cold water, I remember. We'd been diving off the north coast of Ireland and we'd have, because of weather conditions, we'd have to come back across the west coast of Scotland. Um, and, and the water um, around this area was only eight degrees. So it was it was reasonably chilly compared to the sort of balmy 12 or 14 degrees we'd had off the north coast of, of um, Ireland. Um, so we went down the, down the shot line onto the wreck it was very dark because the, the, the water was not terribly clear so by the time we got onto the wreck it was very dark we also discovered as we got close to the, the deck of the wreck that, that getting not just touching but even getting close to the deck um stirred up quite a lot of silt we made our my buddy and i made our way forward along the wreck we found a um a hold hatch um in the deck which i decided I was going to go into and the critical decision that I made at that point was that my plan was I wasn't going to go very far it was a large hatch um, I wasn't planning to penetrate far into the wreck and I made the decision not to attach a line and, and lay a line for that penetration so I dropped down into the into the hold had made my way in a sternwards direction anticipating that I would come across a bulkhead fairly quickly a few moments, a few minutes later, I still hadn't encountered any kind of obstruction. And I decided at this point I was perhaps a little bit far in, given that I hadn't clipped on with a line, and then I was going to retrace my steps and, and head back out. Of course, I turned round into a cloud of silt and very poor visibility. Um, and at this point, my anxiety level started to rise significantly. Um, and um, I was starting to get a little bit worried. Um, of course, because of the fact that I hadn't laid a line. So I went in the direction that I thought was, was the direction I'd come from, taking some comfort from the fact that I was still in low visibility, so the silt that I'd kicked up, um, and I altered my depth a bit so that the, the ceiling of the hold was, was only just above me, so that hopefully I wouldn't miss the hatch. A few moments later, I came into clear water um, with the ceiling still above me and clearly i'd missed the hatch of the hold um, and at that point starting to get more anxious heart rate going up breathing going up a bit and turned around and made another pass um, back into the silt again and i did that two or three times with growing levels of anxiety each time um, until eventually it struck me that really the, perhaps the best thing to do would be to, to turn my lights out and see whether I could see any glow from the hatch because it was quite a large hatch. And I turned my lights out and in actual fact there was a fairly significant glow of illumination from the headlights of, of uh, my buddy who had um, very fortunately made the decision not to clear off and do his own thing elsewhere on the wreck but he had watched me go into the hold he'd made his decision he wasn't going to follow me um, and he just sat there um, on the um, up, up on the edge of this hatch um, with his lights on uh, looking out for me waiting for me to come back and, and that was the thing that produced the glow that I was then able to see and exit the boat and I remember as I, as I came out of the, the hatch, holding on to the edge of the hatch, quite literally shaking um, because my anxiety levels had sort of reached that, that, that point. And we, uh, we finished our dive then and headed back up and completed our, our decompression stops. Looking back at my logbook, I actually did three dives on that wreck that week, but I only remember one of them. And, and that's the one where I nearly got lost in the hold. Um, and certainly I learned a significant lesson from that. So looking at the decision making points, there were a few critical points there, some of which were, were where one might argue some poor decision making was made or some 
um, suboptimal decision making uh, and some other points where perhaps the decision making was, was a little better, um, a little more appropriate, let's say. So the decision to penetrate the wreck without a line um, obviously generated um, some issues and some problems and that's something that I reflected on at length subsequently. My buddy's decision not to follow me in but actually, and, and, and also not to go off and do his own thing but actually to remain in place and look out for me. My decision to do a search pattern with no real vi visual reference other than the ceiling above me, um, not using a line for that process. Pro probably in those days I wouldn't actually have thought of that I think. Um, and my decision to turn my own lights off and, and look for the, the glow of the, uh, of, of the hatch. Um, in actual fact, it wasn't the glow of ambient light I saw, it was my buddy's torch. And we had a, a over a beer or two uh, later in the evening, we had a, a good debrief about, uh, about that dive and about the choices that were made. And, but of course, it's easy to judge choices that are made in retrospect with hindsight. Um, and that doesn't always shed a lot of light on why those decisions were made and what the process was. So you will always all be familiar with these stories of um, catastrophic human errors. So in this one from a few years ago, two grossly negligent surgeons removed the patient's only healthy kidney. They were supposed to be removing the diseased kidney. They removed the healthy kidney and unfortunately the patient went on to die. Um, what was interesting about this particular situation is that there was a medical student in the operating theatre who knew the surgeons were operating on the wrong kidney and tried to alert them to this. But for some reason, perhaps to do with the hierarchical gradient in the operating theatre with the consultant surgeon, um, the, uh, the medical student wasn't able to get his message across. And here are two other incidents, Piper Alpha in uh, in July 1988, where the, um, the, the explosion and the fire on, on Piper Alpha was contributed to by the fact that a supply gas, gas or oil supply line coming from one of the other nearby platforms coming to Alpha wasn't shut down. And part of the reason it wasn't shut down was because the standard operating procedure said not to shut it down and the person operating that, that um, the, the other platform followed the standard operating procedure which, which said not to shut the, the, the gas supply down. There were also some critical decisions made around evacuation, delaying evacuation from the accommodation um, that probably resulted in, in more deaths than there might otherwise have been. British Midland Flight 92, Kegworth, January 1989, and this flight was um, coming in, in to land in London. They experienced an engine problem and diverted towards East Midlands Airport. The captain and co-pilot as they came, as they were coming in to land, um, erroneously shut down the right-hand engine. They did that because in previous models of the aircraft that they'd flown, the cockpit um, air conditioning was supplied from the right-hand engine. They smelled smoke in the cabin, in the cockpit, and they assumed it was the right-hand engine that was causing the, the problem and shut it down. When they did that, the enormous vibrations that the aircraft had been experiencing from the failing engine eased off, and that was actually because the auto throttled, the throttled back the failing left-hand engine. As they came in towards their um, sort of approach, and throttled up again the left-hand engine, it failed completely and the aircraft was then left with, with no uh, functioning engine at all um, and, and crashed just over, just after Kegworth Village, um, right on the side of the M1 motorway with significant loss of life. So those are some examples of critical decision making gone wrong, but but in all of them you can you can understand some of how those decisions were made, whether you know erroneous or not, you can understand what it was that took people there. So just briefly going to look at a little bit of decision making theory now. Um, and I, when I'm doing this, I always like to uh, quote George Box and his uh, um, quote that all models are wrong, but 
some models are useful. So the models don't describe what's going on in real life, but they give us a useful framework to, to think about and analyze um, whatever the subject is that we're looking at. So this is from Rona Flynn's book, um, Safety at Sharp End, and, and, and Rona Flynn draws from other authors in talking about um, naturalistic decision-making. This consists of um, four um, sort of alternative or, or, or different decision-making approaches. One is recognition prime decisions. That's the, the more subconscious bit about pattern recognition um, and identifying the situation. Rule-based decision-making using guidelines, SOPs. Choice decisions where, where we line up all of the potential available options. Um, and select the potentially the best option and creative decision making where we synthesize new alternative options that perhaps haven't been tried before or at least aren't known to us as individuals um, and all of these of course all of these approaches have both their advantages and disadvantages there's no one of these approaches which is ideal for all uh, potential decision making scenarios in particular, recognition prime decision making, that sort of intuitive type of decision making works really well in high time pressure, high stakes environments um, where we've got in incomplete information and dynamic conditions. But in order to do the pack pattern matching accurately um, and effectively, it requires experience. So recognition prime decision making is, is, um, is not so great for novices. Um, whereas rules-based decision-making using guidelines, SOPs, checklists um, can be very effective for, for less experienced practitioners. Daniel Kahneman, um, the author of Thinking Fast and Slow, um, talks about system one and system two uh, thinking or processing, uh, where system one is, is a system that is quick resistant to the effects of stress again very low amount of conscious effort put into it um, <clears throat> and very much based on pa pattern recognition and intuition system two is a much more conscious effort type system it's relatively slow and it's far more prone to the effects of stress and malcolm gladwell in his book blink talks about the, uh, the adaptive unconscious and, and the process called thin slicing. And again, that's very much about this, our subconscious ability to be able to take in a scenario and environment very rapidly um, and attribute characteristics to it um, and analyze that situation in, in a relatively unconscious way. And Gladwell says our, our unconscious is a powerful force but it's fallible. And I think that is the important point to remember here. But he does make the point um, that it can be very effective. Um, so decisions made very quickly uh, can be every bit as good as decisions made slowly and deliberately. It depends on the circumstances and it depends on your level of experience. So you can see from all of these um, theories, um, these models, that there's a common theme of the of the sort of the rapid acting subconscious or, or, or system with less conscious effort put into it versus the slower, um, more conscious, more rational um, uh, decision making processes. And that, that's common through those models. And that led me on to thinking about the Dunning-Kruger effect and this idea that you know unconscious incompetence uh, right the way through to conscious competence, um, and uh, and this idea that you gain a little bit of knowledge and your level of confidence rises up significantly, and and but at that point you really don't know enough um, to be highly knowledgeable and expert in the field. Um, and you are unconscious of your level of incompetence, so you've probably got misplaced confidence at that point. And as you gain in experience and knowledge, one of the first things that occurs to you is actually how little you know and the gaps in your knowledge. And, and, and that's the phase described as conscious incompetence, um, where you're, you, you, you kind of have an idea of what it is you don't know. 
And then as your knowledge and experience grows, you go through a phase of conscious competence, which is where you, you can do it. You can, you know, you have knowledge, but it requires some effort to apply it. You have to think about it. And finally, that golden plateau of, of unconscious competence where you're, you're an expert, you're highly knowledgeable, and you're actually able to apply that knowledge almost without thinking about it. And one of the characteristics of experts in their field is that they can assess and diagnose situations and formulate solutions almost without knowing how they're doing it. And it can actually be very difficult for them to transfer that knowledge to the, to the novice. So if you're going to trust your, your intuition, your gut instinct, your first reaction in a scenario, I would suggest that you want to be an expert in that field to, to give your, your intuition a fighting chance of getting the right answer. Um, if you're very inexperienced, then, then your gut instinct, your intuition um, may, not be, uh, may not be right, certainly has less chance of being right probably. So our decision making is influenced by a huge number of factors and I'm sure this will be very obvious to you, level of technical expertise and, and experience. We've talked about familiarity with the situation or the scenario. Um, or if, if working in a team and you're working in a, a cohesive, highly functional team, conversely, Several different sorts of bias can affect our decision making in an adverse way. Noise and interruption, things that disrupt our thinking, particularly when we're in that conscious thinking um, mode. Poor team dynamics and function, and of course stress and fatigue can have a big impact. Lots of different biases that can that can affect our decision making. I'm not going to go into each of these in, in detail, but be aware of confirmation bias where you look for things to confirm the model that you've got in your head already. You're, you're looking for the world to tell you that you're right rather than looking for things to give you a signal that maybe you're on the wrong track. Also, hindsight bias where we judge events and decisions in, in retrospect um, and it's easy to say something was a, an incorrect or a correct decision um, when we're judging it from the outcome. If, if we limit ourselves to looking at what was the knowledge and the information available at that time, we might take a different view. And sunk cost fallacy that I'll, I'll come on to um, in a moment. Now, this is an infographic um, from, uh, from Wikipedia on the number of different categorized cognitive biases that there are um, and there are a vast array of them um, that can influence our thinking and our decision making and these can influence both the, the rapid system one that Kahneman talks about and our more slower um, conscious system two processing. I'm just going to talk um, a little bit now about stress and fatigue and the impact of those on the performance and particular decision making so clearly stress this will be familiar to all of you i'm sure stress can result in irritability emotional lability um, fatigue so stress can lead directly fatigue either due to disturbance of sleep patterns or due to the emotional impact of stress which can be very draining i can attest to that personally um, impaired judgment forgetfulness incomplete tasks and there's lots of evidence that that stress in the workplace is linked to increased incidence of workplace accidents and that stress directly affects decision making um, and team working in in critical situations fatigue similarly was, can result in loss of concentration and attention reduced vig vigilance and alertness alterations in short-term memory and loss of, of our sort of critical analytical functions, errors in interpretation and therefore of course errors in decision making. And I thought this is quite interesting in terms of cultural factors. Medical staff are much more likely to deny the effects of fatigue on performance than pilots. So maybe pilots are more aware and more savvy to the impact of fatigue. And also interestingly, the way that people rate their own level of fatigue um, at the time of the task shows that people demonstrate more denial 
when they're actually performing the task than if they analyze in retrospect whether they were fatigued at the time so again something to be aware of you know i wonder which which group the divers would fall into would, would we would we deny the effects of fatigue or would we be um aware of it and and able to recognize it and perhaps make a decision to to not do the dive based on fatigue so can we be, be be trained to make uh, better decisions um, and the answer to that is yes there are, there are things that we can do that will improve our decision making there is no magic bullet though there is no solution that, that and guarantees you're going to make great decisions in all circumstances um, in healthcare we use simulation to um, to look at team functioning and study human factors and, and to help with review and improvement of decision making at an individual level and a team level this is um, some screenshots from a, a video of a trauma trauma simulation that we carried out a few years ago using sim simman you can see that in this scenario simman's been subject to a blast injury and he's lost a leg um, and the video follows him from arrival in a and e through the primary and secondary surveys um, off to the CT scanner and you can see in the bottom centre slide there um, what Simman looks like in the CT scanner and finally transfer to, to theatre. So this is sort of the whole um, trauma call scenario that we worked through, videoed and then used the video to debrief the team and look at their own actions, their own decision making, communication, situational awareness. So, so Simulation, particularly simulation with video debrief, can be an incredibly powerful tool for looking at those human factor dynamics within a team. Cognitive decision support, so cognitive aids um, such as guidelines, checklists, SOPs can be really useful. They can be particularly useful for novices, for the less experienced, but also useful for more experienced practitioners as well. And of course, drawing on from simulation that rehearsal of, of, of high risk time critical scenarios so that they become automated so in healthcare we do that with things like um, CPR training for example so that it, so that it almost becomes second nature in diving we do that with things like out of gas uh, situations those things that we drill hopefully on a regular basis and, and that we become comfortable with the scenario um, and know almost instinctively what to do because we're we're shifting towards that 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 scenario towards system one thinking more so some strategies to support good decision making guidelines rules sops particularly help support inexperienced practitioners that doesn't mean that they aren't applicable and appropriate to experts as well but it does mean that experts will have a better handle probably on when to deviate appropriately from a, a guideline or an SOP. We can gain experience from training, practice and from simulation. And I do wonder how much more we could do with simulation and diving, perhaps using computer simulation to run through scenarios and choices and decisions that we might make in those situations in, in real time. Planning ahead of the event, of course, so considering all of our potential failure scenarios and rehearsing and practicing for those either virtually or, or in reality. The use of a team brief, um, because this is about making the team work effectively and using team decision making. So agreeing our primary plan and our contingencies in the event that we run into problems. Allocating roles and responsibilities to the team so it's clear who's doing what and determining communication, how we're going to do that. And of course, in the underwater environment, communication can be a particular challenge and we really need to think about how we're going to do that effectively, particularly in a critical situation. The use of team brief, debrief after, after the dive, after the event, after the scenario, I think it is particularly important in terms of learning reviewing our actions our decisions um at, at not in a critical or accusatory way not in a, with the intention of a, assigning blame 
but to learn from those decisions, those, those actions that we took, and to think about whether we would do something differently if we encountered the same scenario again. And that leads on to the concept of team resource management training, CRM training, which is starting to be um, available now from the, uh, the great work that Gareth and his, uh, his colleagues are doing. Strategies in the moment at the actual time, I think particularly important is recognising the impact, the effects of stress and knowing how to actively manage that. Time doesn't allow me to go into detail on that now, but there are lots of resources that you can look at to, to learn about how to manage stress and anxiety. Can you gain greater clarity in the situation? It, can you gather more information if time allows, particularly using the maximal uh, use of, of the whole team, using team situational awareness, not just individual situational awareness, gathering as much knowledge um, as, as you can and using the creativity and the knowledge of the whole team. If the situation permits, then maybe, as I did with that with that lady on the ventilator, maybe you can try a direction of travel and evaluate the outcome. Um, but that then means, of course, if you're doing that, you need to be able to you need to be prepared to change your out your course of action based on on gathering that information. In, in improvement science, they talk about PDSA cycles, plan, do, study, act. Um, and this sort of thing is a bit like a, a, a mini PDSA cycle. Let's, we think this is the right action. Let's follow this route and see what information we get from that. And maybe it'll give us some more information about whether that's the right direction or not. Beware, of course, the dangers of confirmation bias in that situation, though. Um, if you're looking for confirmation, really looking hard for confirmation of your, that your decision is the right one, you might find that confirmation erroneously because of, of, of your, um, your bias towards your, your own decision. And be really aware of the sunk cost fallacy. I think this applies very much to scenarios like technical diving, like mountaineering, um the, the 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 sort of the perception that you've put so much time effort probably money um into this um, undertaking this expedition this dive um and and if you were to abandon and bail out now then then you've lost all of that investment and that resource that you've made but of course the reality is it's gone already it's lost whichever decision you make um, and, and don't let the fact that you've invested heavily in something um, cause you to uh, to pursue a dangerous course of action to achieve your objective. It's about knowing when to cut your losses. That's assuming that your own safety and the safety of your team is more important to you than achieving your objectives. And it, that very much depends on the situation and your personal approach. And this is just, um, this is a, uh, a document that was sent around by the Clinical Human Factors Group. Clinical Human Factors Group is a group in the UK that was founded by uh, an airline pilot called Martin Bromley, whose wife Elaine Bromley sadly died um, as a result of um, during an operation, um, really as, as a result of failure of decision making, uh, ultimately failure of, of management of, of a situation called can't intubate, can't ventilate, the anaesthetist lost control of her airway and they were unable to re-establish control of her airway for a significant period of time. There's a video about it on, on uh, YouTube, should you choose to watch it. If you Google Elaine Bromley, you will find it. Um, and Martin Bromley, who was himself hum, uh, a, TRM, a CRM instructor in aviation, then went on to get very interested in developing human factors in, in healthcare and founded the Clinical Human Factors Group. So this was an aid that was introduced at the beginning of COVID to help us um, with some key messages about how teams how teams could work better together under pressure, um, and it very much covers um, a, a lot of the the factors that um, that we've talked about over the last half hour or so. Um, but I think all of these um, all of these tips and tricks, all of these strategies, are translatable from one industry. To another. So they're, they're very transferable skills and knowledge. 
So in summary, there is no magic bullet for perfect decision making at all time. We can make instinctive and intuitive decisions rapidly or we can take a bit more time and make more conscious thought out decisions both of those approaches have advantages and disadvantages in different settings and it's worth understanding that and understanding where your strengths and weaknesses lie individually which will depend on your level of experience and expertise in that particular setting. There are strategies that we can use to improve both of those processes both the quick and the slow um, and to support better decision making. I think it's particularly important to learn to recognize and manage stress particularly in that underwater environment and of course to use all of the team resources available. Don't make all of the decision making about one person. Use the capability of the entire team. Uh, and this is just a little bibliography, um, some references that I've used for constructing this talk uh, and, and some further reading that may be of interest to you. Um, and there is, there's a whole wealth more um, out there than this as well um, and I'll be including references in the post course material for those who are interested in looking a little further into the subject. So at this point I shall pause and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you Dr. Thank you, Corp. Do that was a really interesting presentation and I do agree with your statements about quick and fast decision making. Um, and I do personally find that in a dive operation that we need to practice um, our risk management procedures and our emergency action plans and revise them often and um, remember that they are living things, they're not static. And I think as we take those forward more and more in the diving industry, we end up accounting for more of these human factors issues. I also have an aviation background and I am very keen to uh, what we do here. So I don't see any questions in the question group and our producer isn't faster than me this time. I'm trying to be faster than him. So for everybody in hall two, since we have about five minutes remaining, I do encourage you to go to the lobby when the time comes. And you can find Dr. Cope there in the last speaker in Hall 2. Dr. Hope, uh, Dr. Cope, excuse me, I do invite you that in the Human Factors in Diving Conference lobby, there is a booth, uh, for the lack of a better word, I can say a square, since it's just a square on the screen, um, where you can uh, be. And there the um, conference delegates can communicate with you one on one and you can answer questions and provide more data. Thank you. Happy to do that. Okay. So I don't see any questions. Brian, I don't think you're not you're not faster than me this time. So everybody at the top of the hour, we start with our next presentation from Dr. Rothschild. And um, I will see you then. Dr. Culp, thank you very much and wish you a pleasant day.